who are some of the most badass people in history. Nellie Bly went undercover and endured abuse to cover neglect and abuse in Blackwell's asylum, went to Mexico and called out the dictator for going after the press and oppressing his people and then fleed, was exiled out of Mexico because of that, traveled the world in 70-something days to prove you could travel the world in 80 days or less based off the The Jules Verne novel, also did reporting on the Eastern European Front in World War I and also was arrested after she was mistaken for a British spy, and she did so much more. Such a badass and one of my historical heroes. Lakhiman Gurung. On the 12th or the 13th of May 1945 at Taungdor, Burma, now Myanmar, rifleman Lakhiman Gurung was manning the most forward post of his platoon which bore the brunt of an attack by at least 200 of the Japanese enemy. Twice he hurled back grenades which had fallen on his trench but the third exploded in his right hand, blowing off his fingers, shattering his arm and severely wounding him in the face, body and right leg. His two comrades were also badly wounded but the rifleman, now alone and disregarding his wounds, loaded and fired his rifle with his left hand for four hours, calmly waiting for each attack which he met with fire at point-blank range. Of the 87 enemy dead counted in the immediate vicinity of the company locality, 31 lay in front of this rifleman's section, the key to the whole position. Had the enemy succeeded in overrunning and occupying rifleman Lakhiman Gurung's trench, the whole of the reverse slope position would have been completely dominated and turned. This rifleman, by his magnificent example, so inspired his comrades to resist the enemy to the last, that, although surrounded and cut off for three days and two nights, they held and smashed every attack. His outstanding gallantry and extreme devotion to duty, in the face of almost overwhelming odds, were the main factors in the defeat of the enemy. Cassius Marcellus Clay. He was an abolitionist politician and certified badass from Kentucky who freed all of his slaves upon inheriting his father's plantation, letting them stay and paying them a fair wage. He was the Og progressive and did not take shit from anyone. It's no wonder Muhammad Ali was named after him. What is written below isn't even 10% of the absolute badassery this man accomplished in his life. If you want the full story, check out the dollop episode in the comments. Clay had a reputation as a rebel and a fighter. Due to threats on his life, he had become accustomed to carrying two pistols and a knife for protection. He installed a cannon to protect his home and office. In 1845, Clay began publishing an anti-slavery newspaper, True American, in Lexington, Kentucky. Within a month he received death threats, had to arm himself and regularly barricaded the armored doors of his newspaper office for protection, besides setting up two four-pounder cannons inside. During a political debate in 1843, he survived an assassination attempt by Sam Brown, a hired gun. The scabbard of Clay's Bowie knife was tipped with silver, and in jerking the Bowie knife out in retaliation pulled this scabbard up so that it was just over his heart. Sam Brown's bullet struck the scabbard, and embedded itself in the silver. Despite being shot in the chest, Clay drew his Bowie knife, tackled Brown, cut out his eyes, and finally threw him over an embankment. This embankment was actually the top of the Russell Cave for which Russell Cave Road is named after. Trivia for any of you native Lexingtonians. It's on Mount Brilliant Farm just south of Elkhorn Creek, where the event was hosted. Clay served in the Mexican-American War as a captain with the 1st Kentucky Cavalry from 1846 to 1847. He opposed the annexation of Texas and expansion of slavery into the Southwest. While making a speech for abolition in 1849, Clay was attacked by the six Turner brothers, who beat, stabbed and tried to shoot him. In the ensuing fight, Clay fought off all six and, using his Bowie knife, killed Cyrus Turner. He was instrumental in the institution of the Emancipation Proclamation, recalled to the United States in 1862 to accept a commission from Lincoln as a major general with the Union Army. Clay publicly refused to accept it unless Lincoln would agree to emancipate slaves under Confederate control. Lincoln sent Clay to Kentucky to assess the mood for emancipation there and in the other border states. Following Clay's return to Washington, D.C., Lincoln issued the proclamation in late 1862, to take effect in January 1863. He was also appointed minister to Russia and was present for the Tsar's emancipation of the serfs, and his house has its still standing an extremely early form of indoor plumbing and central heating that was revolutionary for the time. 
he donated 10 acres of the land to form Berea College, the first integrated co-educational college in the South. Dude led an extremely interesting life and is, in my opinion, one of the most important unknown and undiscussed figures in American history. Wells Crowther, aka the man in the red bandana, I'm sure most of us have thought about what it must have been like in the World Trade Center on 9-11 and it must have been debilitatingly petrifying. He was 24 years old working on the 104th floor as an equities trader, made his way down to the sky lobby of the South Tower and found a badly burned woman, carried her down 17 floors, then went back upstairs to help guide others to the only passable stairwell, stayed up there helping others and worked working with the fire department until the towers collapsed. He's responsible for saving around 20 lives and died a damn hero. <laughs> Olga of Kiev. This lady lost her husband and when it was proposed she marry his murderer, she was like, sure, send a delegation over so we can talk this out, and they came. She had them dropped in a pit and buried them alive. Then she had another party of men sent to talk about the marriage, and they came. She said, Hey, it was a long journey, why not come relax in this bathhouse, and they did. She set the bathhouse on fire when they were in it. Then Olga went and sent the Drevilians another message. Hey bring out the booze I'm coming to mourn my husband's death in your city. She came, she mourned, she got the Drevilians drunk, and she had them killed by her followers while they were drunk off their asses. Olga went and got her army, laid siege to the place where her husband was killed for a year, then told them, I'm willing to forgive and forget if you guys give me a bunch of birds and the Drevilians did. They turned the birds into mini matches by attaching sulfur to their legs, and then released them, set the city on fire, freaking savage. Thomas Baker Medal of Honor Citation, for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty at Saipan, the Mariana Islands, the 19th of June to the 7th of July 1944, when his entire company was held up by fire from automatic weapons and small arms fire from strongly fortified enemy positions that commanded the view of the company, Sergeant. Then Private Baker voluntarily took a bazooka and dashed alone to within 100 yards of the enemy, through heavy rifle and machine gun fire that was directed at him by the enemy. He knocked out the strong point, enabling his company to assault the ridge. Some days later while his company advanced across the open field flanked with obstructions and places of concealment for the enemy, Sergeant Baker again voluntarily took up a position in the rear to protect the company against a surprise attack and came upon two heavily fortified enemy pockets manned by two officers and ten enlisted men which had been bypassed. Without regard for such superior numbers, he unhesitatingly attacked and killed all of them. 500 yards farther, he discovered six men of the enemy who had concealed themselves behind our lines and destroyed all of them. On the 7th of July 1944, the perimeter of which Sergeant Baker was a part was attacked from three sides by from 3,000 to 5,000 Japanese. During the early stages of this attack, Sergeant Baker was severely wounded, but he insisted on remaining in the line and fired at the enemy at ranges sometimes as close as five yards until his ammunition ran out. Without ammunition and with his weapon battered to uselessness from hand-to-hand -hand combat, he was carried about 50 yards to the rear by a comrade, who was then himself wounded. At this point Sergeant Baker refused to be moved any further stating that he preferred to be left to die rather than risk the lives of any more of his friends. A short time later, at his request, he was placed in a sitting position against a small tree. Another comrade, withdrawing, offered assistance. Sergeant Baker refused, insisting that he be left alone and be given a soldier's pistol with its remaining eight rounds of ammunition. When last seen alive, Sergeant Baker was propped against a tree, pistol in hand, calmly facing the foe. Later Sergeant Baker's body was found in the same position gun empty, with eight Japanese lying dead before him. His deeds were in keeping with the highest traditions of the U.S. Army. Christopher Lee, the actor behind Count Dooku, Saruman and many others was a certified badass, spy and Nazi killer in World War II, had a couple heavy metal albums as well. When Peter Jackson tried to instruct him for the death scene of Saruman, Christopher Lee just calmly corrected him that someone stabbed in the back can't scream, due to the lungs deflating from puncture, he knew this from personal experience. 
Witold Pilecki, a man so badass that he voluntarily and secretly went into Auschwitz as a prisoner and spy to gather information. While there he regularly made reports on conditions and also organized resistance. As the, the war dragged on and conditions became worse, he then successfully broke out of Auschwitz so that he could personally convince his superiors of the truth. As they found his reports too ghastly to be real, Unnamed Viking from the Battle of Stamford Bridge in 1066. By the time the bulk of the English army had arrived, the Vikings on the west side were either slain or fleeing across the bridge. The English advance was then delayed by the need to pass through the choke point presented by the bridge itself. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle has it that a giant Norse axeman possibly armed with a Dane axe blocked the narrow crossing and single-handedly held up the entire English army. The story is that this axeman cut down up to 40 Englishmen and was defeated only when an English soldier floated under the bridge in a half-barrel and thrust his spear through the planks in the bridge, mortally wounding the axeman. Leo Major. Dude turned down his first Distinguished Combat Medal because he didn't like the general who was supposed to give it to him. All good though. He earned two more. A movie about him would be called too unrealistic if they made one. Sergeant. Diprasad Pun of the Royal Gurkha Rifles. He took out 30 Taliban by himself and was awarded the Conspicuous Gallantry Cross. Legendary Pirate. He is my favorite lesser known American. Crazy bastard sailed all the way to England to fight. As if the thousands of British soldiers already in the colonies weren't enough for him to fight. Michael Collins. Showed up seven minutes late to negotiations for the Anglo-Irish Treaty in 1922. And when he was corrected said you've had 700 years. I'll take my seven minutes. Janusz Korczak. He was a military doctor during WW1, a completely committed amazing pedagogue and the headmaster of a Jewish children's home during WW2 in the Warsaw Ghetto. He was given several chances to flee to Palestine, instead electing to stay with the children. Eventually he accompanied them all the way into the gas chamber, to make sure they didn't have to die alone and scared. It's one level of badassery to kill for your cause. It's a whole different level of badassery to walk towards certain death for several years. Endure hardship and starvation, not for some grand cause. Not even to trade your life for someone else's. But only because you feel so much love towards your fellow man. To think it's your duty to make sure they won't have to die alone. Reposting a comment I had on a similar thread a while back. How has no one said Giles Corey yet? He was accused of witchcraft along with his wife Martha Corey during the Salem witch trials. After being arrested, Corey refused to enter a plea of guilty or not guilty. He was subjected to execution by pressing in an effort to force him to plead, the only example of such a sanction in American history, but instead died after two days of torture. As a result of his refusal to plead, on September 17th, Sheriff George Corwin led Corey to a pit in the open field beside the jail and in accordance with the above process, before the court and witnesses, stripped Giles of his clothing, laid him on the ground in the pit, and placed boards on his chest. Six men then lifted heavy stones, placing them one by one, on his stomach and chest. Giles Corey did not cry out, let alone make a plea. After two days, Giles was asked three times to plead innocent or guilty to witchcraft. Each time he replied, more weight. I always felt Jonas Salk was pretty badass. The dude created the first successful polio vaccine and gave away the cure for free. Diogenes. I've never heard of someone who cared about so little. I think my favorite story of Diogenes which obviously could very well be fake but man it's good is. Alexander the Great found the philosopher looking attentively at a pile of human bones. Diogenes explained, I am searching for the bones of your father but cannot distinguish them from those of a slave. Jack Churchill who fought in World War II with a longbow, claymore, and bagpipes, and said after the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki if it wasn't for those damn yanks, we could have kept the war going another 10 years. Jack Churchill, 